The following story that I am about to tell you covers the life of Saint Tecla. Her life was bound to the life of the Apostle Paul, so this story covers a small portion of his life as well. Paul is viewed as one of the most influential figures of the Apostolic Age. He was both a Jew and a Roman citizen, which meant that he could reach both Jewish and Roman audiences to listen to his Christian message. The story begins with Paul going to Iconium, after his flight from Antioch. In his travels he picked up Demas and Hermogenes as his companions. They were, however, full of hypocrisy and not to be trusted. But Paul, looking only at the goodness of God, didn't cast them aside, but loved them greatly. And so he endeavoured to instruct them in the knowledge of Christ. A certain man named Odysiphorus, hearing that Paul had arrived to Iconium, went out speedily to meet him, to invite him to his house. And so he waited for Paul on the road to Iconium. At length he saw a man coming, of low stature, bald on the head, crooked ties, handsome legs, hollowed-eyed, had a crooked nose, full of grace, for sometimes he appeared as a man, sometimes he had the countenance of an angel. Odysiphorus greeted Paul in the following manner. Hail, servant of the blessed God! To which Paul replied, The grace of God be with thee and thy family. Paul's companions, Demas and Hermogenes, were ignored by Onesiphorus and were moved with envy. After which Demas said, And aren't we also servants of the blessed God? Why did you not salute us? Onesiphorus replied, because I have not perceived in you the fruits of righteousness. Nevertheless, if you are of that sort, you shall be welcome to my house. Then Paul went into the house of Onesiphorus. They employed themselves in prayer, breaking of bread, and hearing Paul preach the word of God concerning the temperance and the resurrection in the following manner. Blessed are they who keep their flesh undefiled, for they shall be the temple of God. Blessed are they who have wives, as though they didn't, for they shall be made angels of God. Blessed are the bodies and souls of virgins, for they are acceptable to God, and shall not lose the reward of their virginity, for they shall find salvation from the Lord, and they shall enjoy rest for evermore. While Paul was preaching this sermon in the house of Onesiphorus, a certain virgin named Tecla sat at a certain window in her house. From her window she could hear Paul preaching. She listened to Paul both day and night. She could hear him talk about God, charity, Christ and prayer. She wouldn't depart from the window till she was subdued to the doctrines of the faith. After a while, when she saw many women and virgins going into the house to see Paul, she desired that she might be thought worthy to appear in his presence, for she had not seen Paul's person, but only heard his sermons. But when she could not be convinced to depart from the window by her mother Theoclea, her mother decided to call for Tamiris, to whom Tecla was betrothed. He speedily came to the home of Tecla, and asked her mother, Where is my Tecla? Her mother replied, Tamiris, Tecla for the space of three days will not move from the window, not so much as to eat or to drink, but is so intent on hearing the artful and elusive discourses of a certain foreigner. The foreigner has disturbed the whole city of Iconium. All the women and young men flock to him to receive his doctrine, who besides all the rest, tells them that there is but one God, and that we ought to live in chastity? The young woman is seduced. Now then go and speak to her. Demiris went to see Tecla. He said, Tecla, my spouse, why do you sit in this melancholy posture? What strange impressions are made upon you? Turn to me and blush.
Her mother also spoke to her after the same manner, and said, Child, why do you not reply? Then they wept exceedingly, Timiris because he had lost his spouse, Theoclia because she had lost her daughter, and the maids because they had lost their mistress, and there was a universal weeping in the family. But all these things made no impression upon Tekla. She didn't even make an effort to turn to them, and made no notice of them, for she still regarded the discourses of Paul. Then Timiris ran forth into the street to observe the people who went to see Paul. He saw two men engaged in a very warm dispute, and said to them, Good sirs, what business have you here, and who is that man inside the house, who deludes the minds of men, both young men and virgins, persuading them that they ought not to marry? I promise to give you a considerable sum if you will give me a just account of him. Demos and Hermogenes replied, We cannot so exactly tell you who he is, but we know that he deprives young men of their intended wives and virgins of their intended husbands by teaching that there can be no future resurrection unless you continue in chastity. Then Tamiris said, Come along with me to my house and refresh yourselves. So they went to a very splendid entertainment where there was wine in abundance and very rich provision. They were brought to a table and made to drink plentifully by Timiris. Then Timiris said, Now inform me about the doctrines of this Paul, since Tekla delights in that stranger's discourses, in as far as I am in danger of losing my intended wife. Then Demos and Hermogenes answered together, Let Paul be brought before the Roman governor Costilius as one who endeavours to persuade the people into the new religion of the Christians. Then, according to the order of Caesar, he will be put to death, by which means you will obtain your wife, while we at the same time will teach her that the resurrection which Paul speaks of has already come, and consists in us having children. Timiris, having this account from them, was filled with resentment. And rising early in the morning, he went to the house of Onesiphorus, and said to Paul, You have perverted the people of the city of Iconium, among which is my betrothed Tekla, and because of you she will not marry me. You shall therefore go with us to the governor Castilius. Now Timiris, standing before the governor's judgment seat, spoke with a loud voice in the following manner. Governor, I don't know where this man came from, but he is one of those who teaches that matrimony is unlawful. Therefore command him to declare before you why he promotes such doctrines. While he was saying this, Demos and Hermogenes whispered to Timiris and said, Psst, say that he is a Christian and he will presently be put to death. However, the governor was more deliberate and calling to Paul he said, Who are you? What do you teach? They seem to lay serious crimes to your charge. Paul then spoke with a loud voice, saying, God has sent me to reclaim the people from their wickedness and corruptions, from all sinful pleasures and from death. And to persuade them to sin no more, God sent his Son, Jesus Christ, whom I preach. So, if I only teach things which I have received by revelation from God, then where is my crime? When the governor heard this, he ordered Paul to be put in prison. In the following night, Tekla bribed one of the prison guards, who then opened the doors for her and let her in. She sat down at his feet and heard from him the great things of God. When she saw that Paul was not afraid of suffering, but by divine assistance he behaved himself with courage, her faith so far increased that she kissed his chains. After a while, people noticed that Tekla was missing. Timiris and her family searched in every street, until one of the prison guards told them that she had gone out into the night to see the strange man in the prison. When they found her, they came out of the prison and went and told the governor all that had happened. After a while, he summoned Tekla and said to her, Why do you not... According to the law of the Iconians, marry Timiris. She stood still, 
with her eyes fixed upon Paul, and made no reply. Teoclia, her mother, cried out, saying, Let the unjust creature be burned for refusing Tamiris, that all women may learn from her defiance. Then the governor was exceedingly concerned by the determination of his people, and ordered Paul to be whipped out of the city, and Tekla to be burned. And so everyone went to see the dismal sight. But Tekla, as she was looking upon the crowd, saw the Lord Jesus in the likeness of Paul, and she fixed her eyes upon him, but he instantly ascended up to heaven while she looked on him. Then the people set fire to the pile. Though the flame was exceedingly large, it did not touch her, for God took compassion on her and caused a great eruption from the earth beneath and a cloud from above to pour down great quantities of rain and hail, insomuch that by the rupture of the earth many people were in great danger and some were killed. The fire was extinguished and Tekla was preserved. In the meantime, Paul, together with Onesiphorus, was keeping a fast in a certain cave. When Tekla came to the cave, she found Paul upon his knees, praying and saying, O Holy Father, O Lord Jesus Christ, grant that the fire may not touch Tekla. Be her helper, for she is your servant. Tekla, then standing behind him, cried out in the following words, Lord, creator of heaven and earth, the father of thy beloved and the holy son, I praise you that you have preserved me from the fire to see Paul again. Paul then arose, and when he saw her, he said, O oh my God, praise be unto you that you have answered my prayer. And everyone present in the cave was filled with joy. Then Tekla said to Paul, If you'd like, I will follow you wherever you go. He replied to her, Okay. Then Paul sent Onesiphorus to his own home, and taking Tekla along with him, he went for Antioch. As soon as they came into the city, a certain Syrian named Alexander, a magistrate in the city, saw Tekla and he fell in love with her, and endeavoured by many rich presents to engage Paul in his interest. But Paul told him, I do not know the woman of whom you speak, nor does she belong to me. But Alexander, being a person of great power in Antioch, seized her in the street and kissed her, which Tekla would not bear. She again looked about for Paul and cried out in a distressed loud tone, Don't force me, stranger, for I am a servant of God. Then she laid hold on Alexander, tore his coat and took his crown off his head, and made him appear ridiculous before all the people. But Alexander, partly as he loved her, and partly being ashamed of what had been done, led her to the governor, and upon her confession of what she had done, he condemned her to be thrown among the beasts. Since the beasts would need time to get ready, Tekla convinced the governor that her chastity be preserved until she would be cast to the beasts. The governor then inquired who would entertain her, upon which a certain very rich widow named Tryphena desired that she might keep her, and she began to treat her in her house as her own daughter. After a while, the day came when the beasts were to be brought forth and displayed, and Tekla was brought to the amphitheatre and put into a den, in which was an exceedingly fierce she-lion. All around were a multitude of spectators. The she-lion licked the feet of Tekla, and then her crime was announced to the people. Sacrilege! Tekla cried out, Oh my God, the judgments of this city are unrighteous! After the beasts had been shown, Tryphena took Tekla home with her, and told her about the death of her daughter. Upon hearing this story, Tekla immediately prayed to the Lord and said, O God of heaven and earth, Jesus Christ, Son of the Most High, grant that her daughter may live forever. Tryphena, hearing this, 
sighed again, and said, O oh, unrighteous judgments, O oh, unreasonable wickedness, that such a creature should be caused to the beasts. On the next day, in the early morning, Alexander came to Tryphena's house, and said, The governor and the people are waiting. Bring forth the criminal. But Tryphena ran at him so violently that he was scared and ran away. While Tryphena was running after Alexander, the governor sent one of his own officers to bring Tekla. Tryphena took her by the hand and said, I went with my daughter to her grave, and now I must go with Tekla to the beasts. When Tekla heard this, she wept and prayed and said, O oh Lord, reward Tryphena for her compassion to me and for preserving my chastity. There was great noise in the amphitheatre. The beasts roared, and the people cried out, Bring in the criminal! While others said, Let the whole city be destroyed for this vile action. Kill us all, governor! Cruel sight! Unrighteous judgment! Then they stripped Tekla naked, and the lions and the bears were let loose upon her. The she-lion, which was of all the most fierce, ran to Tekla and fell down at her feet. Then a she-bear ran fiercely towards Tekla, but the she-lion met the bear and tore it to pieces. Again, this time, a male lion ran towards her. But the she-lion intercepted the male lion and they killed each other. Afterwards, they brought out many other wild beasts. Tekla turned around and saw a pit of water and said, Now is a proper time for me to be baptized. She threw herself into the water. When she emerged back out of the water, a cloud of fire surrounded Tekla, which prevented the beasts to come near her. But in the meantime, Tryphena, who sat upon one of the benches, fainted away and died. And Alexander himself was afraid, and said to the governor, I implore you, take compassion on me and the city, and release this woman, lest both you and I and the whole city be destroyed. Upon that, the governor called Tekla from among the beasts to him, and said to her, Who are you, and how can you summon fire and smoke around you? Tekla replied to him, I am a servant of the living God, and as for the fire and smoke, I am a believer of Jesus Christ. He is a refuge to those who are in distress, a support to the afflicted a hope and defense to those who are hopeless, and all those who do not believe in him shall not live, but suffer eternal death. When the governor heard these things, he immediately published an order to release Tekla. Some people in the crowd cried out, There is but one God, the one God who had delivered Tekla. So loud were their voices that the whole city seemed to be shaken. To which Tryphena, who had died, now came back to life and ran to meet Tekla and said, Now I believe there shall be a resurrection of the dead. Now I am persuaded that my daughter is still alive. Come home with me and I will give you all that I have. And so Tekla went with Tryphena, and was entertained there for a few days. But Tekla longed to see Paul, and inquired and sent everywhere to find him. And when she was finally informed that he was at Myra in Lycia, she went to see him. She found Paul preaching the word of God. Paul was not very surprised when he saw Tekla since he figured God would probably save her from the second death sentence. 
Tekla related to Paul all that had befallen her in Antioch. Paul was impressed, but not really. Then Tekla said to Paul, I'm going back to Iconium. Paul replied to her, Go and teach the word of the Lord. When Tekla got back to Iconium, she found her intended husband, Timiris, dead, but her mother living. So calling her mother, she said, Teoclia, my mother, is it possible for you to be brought to a belief that there is but one God? If you desire great riches, God will give them to you. If you want your daughter again, here I am. These and many other things she presented to her mother, trying to persuade her, but her mother gave no credit to the things which were said by Tekla, so Tekla perceived she discoursed to no purpose. Signing her whole body with the sign of the cross, she left the house. When she departed from Iconium, she went towards Seleukia. A bright cloud led her into a mountain called Kalamon. There she abode many years, and underwent a great many grievous temptations of the devil, which she resisted by the assistance from Christ. After a time, certain women, hearing of the virgin Tekla, went to her and were instructed by her in the oracles of God, and many of them abandoned this world and led a monastic life with her. Hereby a good report was spread everywhere of Tekla, and she made several miraculous cures so that all of the city and adjacent countries brought their sick to the mountain, and before they came as far as the door of the cave, they were instantly cured of their illness. Her curing now even caused the physicians of Seleukia to be unemployed, and they lost all their profit from their trade, upon which they were filled with envy and began to contrive methods to stop Tekla. They figured out that the virgin is a priestess of the great goddess Diana, and whatever she requests from her is granted, because she is a virgin. And so they procured some rakish fellows, made them drunk, gave them money, and ordered them to go and spoil this virgin. The fellows went to the mountain and knocked on the door. The holy martyr Tekla, relying upon God, opened the door and said to them, Young men, what is your business? They replied, Is there anyone inside whose name is Tekla? She answered, Well, yes, that would be me. And so they laid hold on her by force and would have ravaged her. But while they held her, she looked up to heaven and said, O oh God, deliver me from the hands of these wicked men. Then Tekla, observing, saw the nearby rock opened to fit a person inside, and so she bravely fled, Hmm. and went into the rock, which instantly closed. The men stood perfectly astonished at witnessing such a miracle, and had no power to detain the servant of God, but only catching hold of her veil, which they tore off a piece from. Thus suffered the first martyr and apostle of God and the virgin Tekla, who came from Iconium at eighteen years of age, afterwards partly in journeys and travels and partly in a monastic life in the cave she lived seventy-two years, so that she was ninety years old when the Lord took her to heaven. Thus ends her life, the day which is kept sacred to her memory is the 24th of September. To the glory of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, now and forevermore. Amen.